All right. Well, here we go. Welcome to the Max Out Mindset Podcast. This is your host, Dr. Larry Whitman, sometimes known as Doc in the Mindset World. I always say my definition of maxing out is given the talent, the experience of the athletes, the coaches, the depth, the health, and the intangibles. Can a, meet, can a team reach the limits of their capabilities? And then can they do it under pressure when it matters the most? I always say, if you can't do it when it matters, what's the point? Um, I do this podcast because I've been blessed over the last 20 years to work with some of the greatest athletes, coaches, and leaders and teams uh, throughout the country. So, of course, I love to share what I learned from them. And then whenever I have an opportunity to have a guest on to learn as much as I can from them and have them share what they've learned about what it takes to be great. I have a very unique guest on today, um, a little bit different than guests I usually have on, but in many ways tied into one of the sports I love, volleyball. Um, for over the past couple decades, he has worked with hundreds, if not thousands of students, helping them prepare for their SATs and ACT scores around the country. Um, he has a company called On to College. He has also been the voice of Husker Volleyball for the past 27 years, I believe. He's a podcast host. He's an author. Um, he's had a unique seat at the table for, the, for University of Nebraska Volleyball that we're going to talk about. And then, of course, today we're going to try to talk about what it takes to be great and what he does in his primary business and what it takes to be great um, as the Husker Volleyball announcer. Welcome, John Baylor, to the Max Out Mindset Podcast. Larry, great to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Yeah, also a, a Stanford University graduate. So, coach, you are a coach. That's what's kind of interesting, right? You are a coach and what you do in your primary world. Teachers are coaches, which is, I think, mm -hmm. is what's so cool. When you hear the way I describe maxing out in my definition, put into words yourself what maxing out means to you. Performing when it counts. A lot of us are pretty good on the driving range, but you know, making that approach shot so it lands in the middle of the green when you're playing for something or hitting that eight foot putt, that's, that's when it's difficult. It, it, the first thing you need to achieve is you know, some sort of level of success when you are practicing and you are preparing, but then translating that into actual success when it counts, that's pretty remarkable. And that's one reason that Nebraska volleyball has so many followers. We just marvel at how somehow when it's a close match, regular season, postseason, you just believe. And you know they're believing. And so often that translates into that elusive success. And uh, so, yeah, I, I love your definition of it. And it's, it is elusive for a lot of people. It can be elusive for me, no question about that. And uh, for those of us who have the, the secret sauce and, and can figure it out, um, they've got a huge, huge advantage. Yeah, I love that. And we're going to have an opportunity to hear directly from you about what it takes to be great in a variety of situations. So for people who don't know you, obviously the Nebraska universe world knows you. I've been very open about this and this isn't obviously not to blow smoke at all, but I've been very open to saying that there is not a better announcer for the sport of volleyball than John Baylor. And um, for people who've listened to you, they know exactly what I'm talking about. For people my age, I would make an equivalent to Lyle Bremser for the former Husker football great announcer that some of us grew up with and resonate with. But for people who don't know you or don't know you as well or only know parts about you, could you tell us just a little bit about your journey as a person in terms of just your background a little bit about how you came up, where you grew up and how, how it kind of led into this unique journey that you have, meaning the job that you've decided to do for your craft, your craft, and then mm. the second craft you have, which is this love of being a volleyball announcer. Well, my parents were divorced. I spent a lot of my childhood in the Boston area, much of it also in the Lincoln area and went to high school in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts and then I went to Stanford and after Stanford, I had a ton of uh, college debt. So now you know what part of the motivation for what I do. And on to college, I had a lot of college debt. So I really had limited choices. I needed to make some money. So I worked on Wall Street for a couple of years and realized fairly quickly, I did not want to do that long term. So then I'm searching. And I think your 20s are a fabulous time to search any path that you think might uh, 
cultivate a passion or allow you to, to uh, realize a passion. And, and I call it the flake window, like really search. Just the, the last thing you want to do is status quo and just repeat what you've already done. You want environmental challenges. You want professional challenges. You just want to be constantly learning. So I threw myself into a variety of pursuits and ultimately uh, ended up in uh, broadcasting in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And I guess I skipped a, a stage where I, I, after I left banking, I went to Los Angeles to be an actor. And you can see how that worked out. And uh, there I needed a survival job. And so I started tutoring very quickly there, started uh, providing SAT preparation, and then I pursued sports casting full time back at my home of Lincoln, Nebraska, or one of my, my two childhood homes. And it was here that I started doing Nebraska volleyball in, in 1994, and all sorts of high school sports and talk shows, and, all, and was just started doing the pest, test prep part time here where it was quite novel. And then after about 10 years, flipped it and did on to college full time. And now really my avocation is uh, uh, calling games, but there was no master plan. I was never planned to be an entrepreneur. I just realized I wanted not to settle. Uh, you got five, six decades uh, spending 50% of your waking hours working. Okay, let's find something I can enjoy. Uh, I mean, if I'm gonna sacrifice, I had good health. I'm, I, I was young, I had no children. I, I had paid off my college debt, okay. What can I expect of others if I myself am I going to sacrifice? No, no, I need to find it. And it's it's tough to find. And a lot of folks in nursing homes are you know, trying to find it. And maybe they never even ask the question, what do I love that I really want to do that's productive that someone might pay me for? And so that led me to sports casting and then Lincoln and then ultimately uh, um, flipping and, and doing the test preparation. So I just kind of have this nice hybrid uh, life now. But there was no master plan. It was other than, look, I, I care primarily about two things. I want to have fun and I want to make a difference. I, I think just having fun is too frivolous for me long-term. I, mean, I get a little antsy after three days on the beach and I'm just too, so, I'm not selfless enough to just sacrifice and, and um, have a purpose. But it's the combination of the two that really makes uh, my heart beat. And have some fun, a lot of it hopefully, uh, and uh, also have um, a purpose. Well, I just love that, Bill. For people that are that listen to this a lot, I talk about grit a lot. And one definition from Angela Duckworth is passion and perseverance for very long-term goals. And one of the things that she did really cool when she wrote her book, and she started to really study grit even more, was that she came up with what I call four psychological assets of grit. Mm -hmm. And one of them was interest. And one of them was the capacity to practice. One was purpose. And then one was hope. And what's, what's interesting of listening to you is that, and I just think this is so important for people in their 20s, and I want to get your feedback, but I, I have a sense of where you'll go with this, is that so many people panic a little bit about having to find their passion so soon, or I have to do something right out of college, or I'll let my parents down, or I'll let my friends down, or what's the perception and what she studied in gritty people that on average, it takes about seven different things that you have interest in before you find your passion. If you're lucky enough to find your passion, the grittiest people, it takes that long and it takes this ability to have an open mind, to explore, to have an interest, to be willing to, like you said, what can I be great at that also I can be productive at, have fun and make a difference in this world. And so what is your thoughts on that? Oh, I have so many. Uh, but I think the wrong question is, what are your interests? I think the better question is, what are your questions? And if you follow your questions, those are things that are inherently matter to you. You want answers to. They then become transformed into actual uh, interests. But it just sometimes we ask young people, what are your interests? And I'm like, ah, what are your questions? Oh, okay. Um, you know, now they've got some ideas. They're, they're things they inherently... Uh, have interest in and they want to have answered that leads to okay then let's pursue this let's uh, uh, pursue that but I think Larry it's, it's as important to check off what you're not interested in as it is finally to learn what it is you do want to pursue and that just requires diving in being vulnerable I mean I like to say success is awaits at the top of a staircase of failures and so you, you got to try things I mean I Oh my goodness. I mean, I thought I wanted to be a banker. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought I wanted to be an actor and I was okay, but I, 
it just wasn't it what it wasn't didn't fit me and i thought i want to be a sportscaster and a lot of it you know i i still am and i and i and i find it to be just pure fun uh when i when i uh sportscast and i remember when i kind of one more time upended my life and left los angeles where i was, had lots of good friends and i was you know i had a life that looked good on the surface and came to lincoln nebraska you know where i had grown up this place i had always thought of as a sanctuary and i was going to live it full time that's always scary right when you you take a place that's a sanctuary you go back and and you mend and you you strengthen now you're gonna live there full time so now where do you go if things don't you know so in here i in my world just completely changed and then i listened to myself on the air calling Lincoln Southeast or you know Omaha Central basketball and football and I was bad. I'm like, oh my goodness, how could I have been so foolish to think that this? Anyway, that's where things are when you're starting. You're you're, you're not a finished product. None of us are. And so you've you, the the closed mindset that holds back so many people, not just kids but adults, that suggests, oh, we always have to look good. Oh my goodness, I'm not going to try that because I might look in person. You're you're mortal. You're Homo sapien. You are imperfect, okay? So that's tough for young people now in this world where it's about images and branding, personal branding. I mean, a term I certainly wasn't aware of uh, years ago. They always wanna look good. Okay. No, that is a pathway to a superficial, hollow, low ceiling life. It's when you are challenging yourself, recognizing, oh, and I don't understand something, that's my, my brain yelling to me, thank you. That's exactly what I need. I need to get stronger like a, like a regular muscle might. Uh, that liberates and that suddenly makes you realize, hey, you know, oh, you know, you know, on the air, you know, when I make a mistake, I'll kind of crack a joke or like, you know, and it, it, people identify with that because none of us are finished products. Yeah. So now if anybody was wondering why I was so excited about talking to John Baylor on this podcast, that last answer is everything right unique your perspective nobody could say it that way very few people think about it that way but people know i'm such a growth through adversity person and that we learn more from failure than success but you said it the closed mindset people of this world for a lot of different reasons it's a very challenging place to be and growth mindset is where it's at but that requires a lot of support and practice and Mm -hmm. uh, this awareness of what growth mindset can do for you. So give me one example, because you kind of paired it to coming back here, but the acting world, I think some people can relate to, right? I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want to be an actor or a musician or do something in the performance world that is very hard to be successful at, right? Um, could be owning a restaurant, another high failure rate. What did you learn about yourself from your experience trying to be an actor in LA and um, how did you deal with that? I guess we could call that a failure in a sense, meaning you, mm -hmm. your goal was to go out there and be a, an actor oh. and um, you ended up coming back to Lincoln, your sanctuary. Tell, tell us about that experience and about how it shaped you as a person. I learned a lot of things, Larry. Uh, when you know, John Baylor, who's in no way trained to be an actor, who'd done a little bit of college acting, a little bit of high school acting, suddenly decided, okay, I'm gonna be like a movie star. I learned that uh, life is a marathon. It is not a sprint. I mean, I thought I was going to be discovered by baggage claim. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I thought, you know, I, I, I had this completely unrealistic expectation for, for success. And, um, and uh, I mean, that's the, that's the kind of pursuit, like all pursuits. I mean, we ideally, if we're growing and pushing ourselves and we, we, my son has this phrase, rise and grind, rise and grind. I just love that phrase. I don't know. I wish I'd given it to him. I, I stole it from him. He's 16 and he's got this sign in his room, rise and grind. It's, it's, I'm, you, you, we, we ideally are constantly progressing. And, and so I'm such a better, in my opinion, broadcaster now than I was 10 years ago. I'm such a better teacher than I was 10 years ago. I can react to a room so much better than I could 10 years ago. The things I said on my talk shows, some of them, not all of them, some of them, when I was in my late 20s, I just, it, it, it's reflective of a, a less experienced mind. And so the idea that I could go and fairly quickly have success at a profession that's so hyper-competitive, it was illusory and, and uh, it was very humbling. And the fact that I was getting rejection after rejection, you know, if you, if you nail one out of 20 auditions, <laughs> you're amazing. 
can nail one out of 80. That's kind of average. And that's a long time to get 80 auditions for commercials or TV shows and stuff. And so that was something I was unaccustomed to. And I needed to be knocked down a peg. I, I, I remember my cousin uh, telling me when I was in high school, you know what? You could use a little bit of failure. You're, you're, you, got, you, you, got, you got a little bit of an attitude right now. And you know, things went fairly well for me in high school. And I, you know, I loved that experience, but he was absolutely right. And it's that humility that makes the storms of life much more understandable, manageable, and possible to overcome. I love that. So I just have to tell you one quick story because you said rise and grind. And I actually write about it in my book, Max Out Mindset. And here's why. Kenny Bell, you may remember him. He was a Husker football yeah. player, kind of bigger than life, big, yeah. kid, great personality, great kid. He really is. And uh, just one of my favorite players that I got to cross paths with. Before his senior year, Twitter was just kind of exploding then. He used to have as his hashtag, rise and grind and then you'd have money year. And why I write about it is because I say, and I, I remember talking to the team about it that time too. I put it, I put it up on the, because I said it two a days are hard. Summer conditioning is hard. You can walk in to summer conditioning every day or two a days back then when they had two a days and you can come with a bad attitude. I'm tired. I'm sore. I don't want to get out of bed. What's the point? I'm not even going to start this year or what he decided, which was every day he was going to wake up, rise and grind, you know, like rise and shine. And there was a, a carrot to him, which was his money year. He needed to, he needed mm. to crush it that year in preparation to get his, you know, opportunity at the NFL, which he did. And I always said that's positive self-talk to me, meaning that's mm. a positive mantra to when you wake up at six in the morning, five in the morning to go to 6 a.m. and get crushed you know, in hundred degree heat, you can wake up with the mindset of rise and grind or, you know, I, I hate this. Right. And oh. that mindset has everything to do with whether I can or I can't. So when you said that about your son, I said, rise and grind. What do I think of? I think of Kenny Bell and his senior year preparation that allowed him to get his opportunity in the NFL. Hard work and preferred outcomes absolutely correlate. Uh, work and outcomes. Quite. I know we have this phrase called hacks and they're kind of fun to review and maybe now and then one might work. There's just no substitute for the work. And we all understand, or most of us understand the compounding effect of money. Well, it's the same is true for effort. And so, I mean, you put in 20 minutes of piano practice a day, and I mean, seven, six days a week, you'll be amazed, whatever your age, what you can do in, in 60 days. You'll be amazed at what you can do in a year. It's 20 minutes a day. I'm not talking about a classical, classically trained piano player who puts in five hours a day, which all of us, most of us cannot uh, empath uh, understand. I'm just saying 20 minutes a day. It's the effect of compounding work, money that uh, can amaze. But who's willing to put in the discipline? I mean, uh, I, I, I was thinking recently about, you know, who I, did I grow up with that are most successful, according to uh, sort of my definition of, of success. And two of them, one grew up in upper middle class, one grew up in the middle class, and they from in their teen years were just focused and working. Like, you know, they had a couple of jobs. I had three jobs when I was in 10th grade, so this is foreign to me, but uh, they were just working hard on a daily basis. And now in their 50s, they just have really wonderful lives. And it's, they, were, they were given some things, so they, they weren't denied a lot. They were given some things, but they then put on top of that, this daily effort and oh, they've just built wonderful lives for themselves. And then you, people my age who struggle, often there are issues that suggest a lack of discipline, self-discipline on a fairly regular basis that have sabotaged. So uh, people make a living posting, you know, top five hacks to, you know, becoming a millionaire, whatever it is, don't buy it. It's it, it's the daily work. Uh, if I had put in the daily work for acting, I'm not saying I would have been a star. I'm saying I probably could have made a living at it, but I learned very quickly. No, this is not where my heart is. It, to put in the daily work. You got to want to put in the daily work. Kenny Bell loves football. You know, I love teaching and changing lives. I love the fun of you know sports casting. So I'm very willing to put in the work. Okay, so two things. One. Since I brought up grit before, 
one of those key assets is the capacity to practice. And what mm. we meant, what she meant by that, and what I mean by it is deliberate practice, meaning this intentional practice that's hard, it's focused, you can't do it for a very long period of time. Hence, it's one of the reasons why Coach Cook's teams are so successful. If you've ever mm. been to one of his practices, you'll never meet a team that has more intentional, where the failure rate is high, where you get immediate feedback, usually about what you did wrong. And it's called deliberate practice or this capacity to practice. Um, so you already kind of hinted at that, that one of the things that made your, these two people successful was this mm. long period of time of this ability to practice their craft and have it compound. But since you brought it up, you said the way I define success, can you put in to your own words, what, what is the definition of success to you? Um. Uh, the willingness and capacity to take productive risks uh, on your own terms. Uh, the, uh, the ability to, to, to have the discretion to say no uh, and, this, and, this, uh, and this personal strength uh, to say no. So are these two friends, good friends of mine actually, and I don't use that word loosely, uh, good friends of mine, um, yeah, do they have some financial wherewithal now? Have they built some wealth? Yes, they have. But why are they successful? They're living life on their own terms. They are, here's another, this is related. They are almost ignorant of social expectations. You know, they are almost unmindful of what they're supposed to be doing. And that is so empowering. And again, that's related to the ability to say no, to live a life of discretion, not on someone else's terms. And, um, but to, to be more foundational, I mean, to me, life, uh, happiness, Larry, is about two things. Uh, primarily, it's, it's about relationships and purpose. Relationships and purpose. And with these two gentlemen, both are very, very strong. So, a life of success is full of relationships and full of purpose. Often they overlap. If you're doing something you love, guess what? You find others who are like-minded and you develop close relationships. You got people you care about. You find things that you do together that you love. So they're related, but um, they have both in spades. Yeah, I love that. When you define success that way, where are you on that path? I got a long way to go. Um, what do you do well? Uh, what do I do really well? Uh, I, I think I, I, um, I, I'll just, I mean, I, look, I, I've been doing a lot of the same thing for like 20 some years, right? I've been doing a lot of broadcasting and I'm doing a lot of building of my business and anything above the age of 80 to me is gravy. And you don't know if you're going to be alive after 80. You don't know if you have any physical strength after 80. So yeah, I'm, I just turned 56. So I'll just tell you that, you know, I'm a bit at a crossroads. Uh, I don't know a lot of people my age who are not. Uh, and so I think deeply about, you know, what makes the most sense for me to put my, my skills and my, and my knowledge and direct them. And right now I'm pretty good at staying focused on trying to change young people's lives and changing high school cultures. And um, that's what we do at On to College by raising scores and working on high school cultures. And I've got a fabulous team of about 20 people that we do that every day. And we work with more than 700 high schools in about 26 states. And, and then um, I'm also pretty good at making sure finally, and this has been a lifelong chore of making sure the people that do matter to me know it. You know, I lost some uh, close friendships when I was younger because of this, oh, hey, game show host is my description of kind of approach to everything. And uh, you know, people who thought they meant a lot to me and who actually did, didn't get that message from me. And so I make sure my children every day, every time I see them, I say, I love you. Mm -hmm. Or I say, love you. I don't know if I say, I love you. I love you. Uh, that's kind of how we interact. And I love it when they say that to each other. And then I, I now, um, I mean, I lost a, uh, I lost a stepdaughter, uh, my daughter. Uh, um, she passed away about a, a year ago now. And then I have a, a, a 
brother who's a little younger than I, who's had um, a mental health condition since he was age 18. And so I'm just tired of superficiality. I'm sick of it and I don't want it. And there's not enough time for it. So I let, you know, I'll turn down luncheon invitations and I will let people know to the extent I'm capable of um, trying to get more and more honest every day. But you know what? I, I want to spend time with you. You matter to me. And I try to show that all the time. So uh, the answer, what am I really good at? I, I, I want to be better. I mean, some others from their lens might think I'm really good at um, focusing and doing the best I can at the things I care about. But uh, um, I, 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 I still find myself overly distracted. And so I, I, I don't like that. I just, to silence the noise, noise and be totally focused on what I'm doing. That's two of the reasons I love teaching because you can't be thinking about something else. Mm -hmm. And I love broadcast because you can't be thinking about something else. And when I did other things, my mind would wander. I don't like that. Yeah. I mean, all the coaches describing or John Baylor is right. I mean, mindfulness, being present, Mm -hmm. And our minds don't want to be there. It's very mm -hmm. difficult for anybody, especially today's society, to not be distracted to the past, to the future, the worries of the past, the worries of the future. What could I have done better? What's about to happen in this world? And, and I love how you describe that. When you're doing certain things that you love, oh. you're present. And I, I talk about this briefly in my book, meaning... I always would train, teach people, how do you train mindfulness? And there's formal ways and informal ways. I won't go into that right now. Um, but I had a hard time putting into words what mindfulness meant to me. And you can relate to this, but I didn't realize until afterwards why I loved coaching flag football so much. And I always thought it was because, well, one, my kid was, my son Bennett was younger and I get to coach his friends. And that's all true. But what I really figured out was that during that hour of practice and during that hour of the game, I was completely mindful. I mean, that's when I carried a pager because I worked at the hospital. I had someone always cover during that time. I never thought about the hospital. I didn't think about patients. I didn't think about family issues. I was just that one hour, I was completely locked in. And when people think about what they love the most in this world, whatever it be, activities, formal or informal, and you hear them, it's, a, it's an hour having coffee with a friend. It's because their minds were completely locked into the presence. And there was very limited time to where their mind ever drifted. And if it did, they brought it right back to the present. And that's where the most exciting, most wonderful experiences of this world take place in these mindfulness conditions. But what are your thoughts on that? Uh, amen. It, it, that's when you know you found it, is when you are undistracted. So now you're fully focused. So your performance actually approaches your potential. You have got it and chase it. Keep doing that. And when I started broadcasting, I'm like, oh my gosh, with my headphones on, I'm not thinking about anything else. I'm just thinking about calling this game or doing this talk show. And, and wow, it's so liberating. And oh my goodness, the, the my ultimate product is, 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 uh, receiving near a hundred percent of my capacity at this moment. And when I'm teaching, you know, I, I can't be thinking about lunch or I can't be thinking about a regret. Or I can't be thinking about next week. I got to make sure I'm in the moment because I got up this huge audience. And that's when your performance can approach your potential. And so when you watch volleyball players, they don't wish they could go sneak a look at their phone. You know, they're not thinking about grandma. They are in the moment and it is so liberating unleashing and so when you find that chase it and i struggled finding that in cubicles mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, uh some people can uh and some people have more disciplined minds than mine but boy i think that's why there's this all this whole movement in education project-based learning and engaged learning is that you know, the, the mind alone can be stimulated only so much before it wanders. Whereas if your full body is engaged, it's more likely potentially that you, you provide full focus. So uh, yeah, when you have found that moment, I remember the first time I ever felt that, uh, that, oh my goodness, this exists. Like, I don't have to, you know, pretend I'm enjoying this or sort of be giving a full effort or trying to fool people into thinking I'm giving a full effort. I am giving a full effort. And people may not know it, but wow, 
this can happen as an adult. Yeah, so cool. So, I mean, you, when I asked you what you did well, you know, a lot of people would immediately go to, what did I do? What do I do well in my business? What do I do well in, you know, other things? And you said, what I do well or what I need to continue to do better is let people in my life that are important to me know that I'm in, that I'm in, they're important to me. And that's what's so cool to me, right? So um, I don't even know that I have to spend a lot of time going there, but I am curious about one thing with Onda College because I think it's pretty obvious. One of the things you said, of course, what you're trying to do is have people score better on their tests because that allows them to maybe get into the college of their choice or even get monies to go to college. But you also added a second point to that. So I want to ask you about that first which is, you said part of what you do at Onda College also is improve high school cultures. What do you mean by that? Well, about um, eight out of 10 elementary school students, according to recent studies, are engaged in school. About four out of 10 are engaged in high school. So we have this huge culture of disengagement, a crisis of disengagement in our student culture, and it worsens as students age. My whole passion is to engage students because then of course we're gonna have the improved outcomes. So I get measured by the outcomes, but I'm thinking, hold on here. If we can plant a better garden, we're gonna get better flowers. So my whole goal, I'm trying to take this life experience I've had and figure out you know, what is the secret sauce so that um, you know, a lot more kids ultimately grab, basically 80% of, of high school kids graduate and about 55% of those kids who graduate ever graduate from college. So, or, or get certified in a trade. So, I mean, you've got 42% nationwide who get either a two or four year college degree and then the 5% primarily males who get certified in a trade. That's 47%, 53% of our adults are out there with merely a high school diploma or worse, no high school diploma. That's pretty tough in a world with AI and globalization. They're at a huge disadvantage. Statistically, there are exceptions. So to me, when I look at that, you know, 20% high school dropout rate, 45% college dropout rate, that's all about effort. Or when I look at the average ACT score nationwide, it's about a 20. I mean, a 20 is about 50% of the questions right and about 50% of the questions wrong. That is in no way representative of the cerebral capacity of these kids. It's representative of their engagement. And we got to figure out how to make sure that our high school cultures are as engaging as possible. And all these high schools and, and, and states are, are basically chem labs and they're all experimenting and trying to figure out the perfect formula. And, it's, and it, what's perfect over here may not be perfect over here. It kind of depends on you know, what kind of students you have arriving. But I just know this, we can do better and we need to do better because primarily of this, uh, that, that, that's a huge enemy of learning. It's a huge enemy, but hold on, John. It's a actual, it's a computer in your pocket, fine. Compare the amount of time you Google things you really wanna know about versus the amount of time you just waste. Uh, so the, this is a net deficit, deficit creator when it comes to uh, trying to uh, help people reach their potential. So uh, yeah, I work with a lot of high schools and try to create a narrative that permeates the entire ecosystem so that Billy and Billy's parents upon entering every time that building understands the high expectations and why they exist and uh, they are willing to uh, to buy in and give it and give it their best so yeah that's 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 what drives me yeah it's, it's really cool because what as you what you suggested is there's a lot of disengagement well there is mm -hmm. Well, in the adult workforce, it's well over half that are just engaged as well. So if you can teach them a better sauce now and build a better garden, maybe we have less in, uh, engagement issues as adults. So, um, so let's switch it to the individual for a minute. You know, I talk about elite mindset ingredients, commitment, meaning being all in, right, to whatever it takes to be great. There's a physical part, there's a mental part, there's a technical and a tactical. I'm sure that's, tr that's true for test taking as well. All those things, the physical would be just getting your sleep at night if you want to be take a great test the next day or day. Exercise during the 10 minute break right. in the middle of the test. The right nutrition, right? Yeah. For fuel for performance. So sometimes we think, well, this isn't sport. What do you mean there's a physical component? Sleep, nutrition are two examples. You know, then there's a mental component. There's a technical, meaning 
you know, you got to learn how to study the craft. And then there's a game plan to how you go about it, which I'm sure you teach as well, depending on the test. But um, so I say there's four ingredients. There's the commitment. I just said there's confidence. There's composure, which is managing our nervous system when it matters. And then there's a concentration piece, which I call focus. But I also call equally important the ability to refocus because most of us, at least that are high performers, are pretty good at at least the initial focus. Mm -hmm. It's just when our mind gets distracted for whatever reason, a bad call in sport, that test question I didn't anticipate. I thought I would know that first question. I don't know the answer. And our mind gets distracted to worry. How quickly do we refocus? So of those ingredients, when you think about what you teach, to make somebody improve their score on the SAT and the ACT when you're looking at commitment, concentration, confidence, and composure, are all four of those equally important? Or take me through what you actually think you actually train in somebody so that their outcome is a better school, I mean, a better test performance. Which ones of those mindset ingredients are we, mm -hmm. are you training or are you training all of them? Hopefully. Uh, all of them, and especially in an, an, an anxiety-inducing experience, preparing for and ultimately taking these tests of some consequence. But I, I, I kind of synthesize it this way, uh, Larry, and we're probably saying something quite similar. I think you have to have very clearly stated goals and why they exist. Like uh, Nebraska volleyball, we're here to win championships. Pretty self-evident. We don't need a why, all right? But in school, okay, or when I'm running my course, we're here to jump scores, all right? Why? It's the best paying job I ever have in high school, all right? Because it's gonna trigger all these scholarships. But hold on, I'm gonna be a tradesman, fabulous. I mean, electricians often make more than architects and lawyers. Uh, so how does this help you? Communication skills, math skills, future work-related diagnostic tests. So what are, we, what are our clearly stated goals and why do they exist? The kids have to buy into them. And then two, I hope you know that I, I impart I, the expertise and the energy required so that my students realize, okay, I can achieve those goals. And if I buy in and do what he suggests, I can achieve that. So a you know, coach who's you know, clearly got the, the, the wisdom, the experience, the energy uh, it needs to impart that for those kids so they have the buyout. So you have the clearly stated goals, you have, have the knowledge and skills to um, make sure that your, your recipients believe they can achieve. And then here's the big one that maybe you didn't state. I think it's huge. Simplify. I mean, Dean Smith was pretty simple. Play hard, play smart, play together. Play hard, play smart, play together. I mean, the Gettysburg Address lasted less than two minutes. The guy who spoke before Lincoln spoke for more than two hours. No one remembers his name or anything he said. When I was growing up, we had to memorize the Gettysburg Address. I wish we still did. I wish we still had to memorize the state capitals, but um, it's about simplification. Um, it's, there's only so much the human mind can, can take in at a time. So uh, what we do at On to College, when we have to teach grammar, which is a huge part of the English section or writing and language on the SAT, is we simplify it down to 19 grammar rules. 19 grammar rules, English teachers are thinking blasphemy, there's more to English than 19 grammar rules. True, but it's not on the test and it's not particularly prevalent in life. This is it, 19, not 190, 19. And we're gonna learn it in one hour. And the entire curriculum is eight piece of paper. And it's by design. And the entire course takes uh, two and a half times five, it's 12 and a half hours if you take it live. It's less than that if you do the pre-recorded version. Um, and so once in a while, a parent will say, is that enough time? I mean, these others, they do 40 hours. And I say, you're right. I apologize. I wish it could be shorter. This is as condensed as I can get it. So um, clearly stated goals, you have to have the wisdom and knowledge, expertise, and, and maybe entertainment skills to make your recipients, your students, your teammates, your, your team believe that they can accomplish that goal. And then thoroughly keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, that's the technical and tactical part. The tactical is the game plan, meaning you have these things, your 19 rules. That's your game plan. That's your technical piece. So, and so I'm going to put it back into my words, meaning what you really trade is commitment. You are training the all in preparation. And the reason why that's so important to me is that I tie it right into confidence because you mentioned that, that I've got to get them to believe 
that they can do this better. Well, you have to earn the right to believe or have confidence. I tell people you can, yeah, I mean, if you're going to take a second grade test and you're a 10th grader, you don't have to prepare. You walk in, I'm, I got this. <laughs> you're going to take a tough test like the ACT or SAT that may be even more challenging than what you normally do and you want to have belief, you have to have a foundation. And my foundation is, is commitment means because the number one ingredient of confidence, people know this and listen, but if you haven't listened in a while, is preparation and hard work. You've got to put in the work. Mm-hmm. Then I always say the number two ingredient is your self-talk. If you mm-hmm. put in all the work, but the minute you start failing at something, you beat yourself up, you shank a pass in volleyball, you have two questions in a row on a test that you don't aren't certain about the answers, and now you're starting to doubt yourself. <clears throat> if you've put in the work and your, your test prep coach has told you, look, that's going to happen. Here's your strategy. Um, now we're like, you know what? I got this. This is good. Because mm-hmm. our self-talk changes versus, oh my gosh, here we go. I'm going to mm-hmm. fail this test. I've just blown my m- parents' money and all my time. Could we go negative when we hit a bump in the road on the test or do we go positive? I've got this. I've put in the work. I can do this. And then I always say the third ingredient is what teammates and coaches say to me, this engagement, this Our teammates and coaches can help or hurt our confidence in critical moments. And part of what you do is impart confidence in them as a coach. So they have to do some responsibility, but then they do as well. And then the fourth one is past success, which means the more you can have them take test preps and practice tests where they can see that they're improving. Now we have something to fall back on to. Like I've been successful at this before rather than, um, well, I'm just hoping and praying. So there's, I say there's a lot of ingredients that we can train for confidence. And the why I say it's so important is, t- is to what you said, which there can be nerves mm. during a test. But if you've trained confidence, you've put in the work, you know how to talk to yourself, you've had others know how to talk to you in a team setting, this is more individual, and you've had past success, you won't have any fear. Nerves are fine. We can deal with nerves. As long as we are confident and the fear and the doubt don't creep in to where it starts to kill our performance. That's true in sport. That's true in life. That's true in tests. And so what I hear you really do is you train commitment and confidence, which allows that composure that you may not teach. Maybe you do, but you may not teach them specific deep breathing techniques. But because you've trained commitment and confidence in them, of course, it's going to be way more easy to stay composed in a tough situation. So and. My building blocks of an elite mindset, I won't bore you with all of them, but one of them is goal setting. So I jump forward to the end goal, which is how do you get confident? Well, part of that is, is, and composed, is to have clear goals about why you're doing it. And I always say by the end of my my role with the team is if I haven't explained the why, why are we training mindset? Why is it so important? What do we train and how do we train it? Well, then I fail them. And what you do is you, you, you have a very clear why. Why do we do this? Well, it helps you get into college. It helps you get money for college. And it also helps you for life if you are going to trade school. Mm-hmm. All right. And then you start to get into, well, what do we train? If we're going to sit down and spend 12 and a half hours, wish we could do less. Um, but what do we train and how do we train it? And if you've done all those, now you have this outcome of performance that you can measure, um, that you need to measure, um, that goes beyond the engagement and the fun piece. So you've explained it to me. So What I want to ask you now then is you said it earlier, you weren't very good as an announcer early in your career. You don't have to say it. I say you're the best at what you do in the world. Whether you agree with that statement or not, I'm not asking, I'm not asking you to agree with that. How have you gotten better at your craft? What have you done over the last 10 or 20 years that puts you in that space that maybe others like me or others say there's nobody better. Oh, So kind of you to say, Larry, well, when I started out, I'd roll up the windows of my moving vehicle while I was driving it and invent games and scenarios and call them and invent invent names of players. And so when I was actually performing, I had already practiced that uh, as often as I possibly could. And I wanted to become good as quickly as I could. So I didn't leave when I could. I stayed late and I listened to my tapes and, and it's painful. Uh, to realize there's so much room uh, for improvement. And then almost imperceptibly through time, I became competent, I would say. And, and then uh, I guess I've come to a place where, you know, Terry Pettit and you are just so complimentary of of what I do. And I think there are two things that really help distinguish me now. This is 
probably fairly specific to broadcasting is because of on to college, I didn't need the broadcasting money. That's really liberating. When I talk to young broadcasters, I say, find a side hustle so that you can do it your way. And if they fire you, there's still food on the table. That's pretty scary. If you put all your eggs in this broadcasting basket, I hope you join the 250, maybe it's 500 at most, who can make a really comfortable living at it. And you probably can name off the top of your head, 50 of them. They're that kind of people and they're really skilled. But that's a pretty elite group to join. This is kind of a safer thing to find something else. So you don't need them because what did that do? That liberated me to do it my way. And what's my way? I always search for the humor. I love to laugh and I love to make people laugh. And one thing I didn't tell you, I tried again, big failure, uh, to be a stand up comic when I was in New York. All right. I did that at night while I was working at the bank during the day. I tried a lot of things, Larry. Um, all of them very legal. And, um, and so I just love comedy and I love stand up comedy. And I just love finding, uh, finding the humor in anything. And so suddenly I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna be myself. And so the person on the air is very much an extension of the person you see in real life. I mean, my wife often will tell me, Susan will often say, you know, and rightfully so, look, we don't need any humor right now, okay? This is a serious moment, okay? <laughs> every, every spouse knows these moments, okay? Um, and she's absolutely right. But when I'm with friends, uh, there's a time to be serious, I hope, We've had, we've had plenty of these times during this conversation, but boy, I love to laugh. And if an entertainer makes me laugh, oh, I'm so, I'm so grateful. So uh, it was with hard work, but then doing it my way. And the other thing is I don't listen to other people. I mean, I'll watch an NFL game occasionally, so I, I know what good work is, but I don't really know what other volleyball broadcasters do. I've listened to a little bit of Vin Scully when I lived, lived in LA, I was driving around but not a ton. I don't want to be a cookie cutter. I don't want to be a replica, but I'll tell you, that's not the smartest path to go. You want to make it in a conformist world. Don't listen to what I'm talking about. But like Jeff Bezos says, he says, I mean, if you don't want to offend anybody, you're never going to do anything great. So I don't think I offend anybody, hopefully when I'm on the air, but I think I have a unique style and somehow it's a style that others have, um, it's resonated uh, with others. So I just, I just, I don't wanna live my life according to other people's expectations. I wanna do it as long as I'm not being a jerk, as long as I'm being kind and generous in a way that's, that's um, consistent with, with who I am and, and how I grew up and who I wanna be. Yeah, I love that. I mean, you mentioned a little of the technical piece of it, the preparation over time, but most of this is what I always say it comes down to in every endeavor, it's always the non-sport, non-business, non-craft skills that separate the people. Mm -hmm. You've got to have the talent. You can't play for a national championship without talent. But as we may touch on here, as we wrap up here at the very end, which is even most of Coach Cook's and Coach Osborne's football teams, if you ask them, they'll say their teams that advance the farthest were rarely their most talented teams. They had plenty of talent, but mm -hmm. often their most talented teams fell short. Even though it may not have looked like it fell short to the rest of the world, they might have made the finals or the final four, but they mm. fell short. And, and it's usually the non-technical skills that separate out, being myself, using humor, um, rather than, well, I call the X's and the O's so well. Like I, you know, but that being said, right, you do call the X's and the O's uniquely well. Um, was that a learned skill as well? Like, Talk to me about your knowledge of volleyball and what role that plays in being a great announcer for you. And is that in part what resonates with so many Husker fans that are knowledgeable fans about what they love about you? Or is it even the more non-technical skills that they love? I think you're right. I mean, they, they stick with me and they stick with the broadcast and they get to the humor and the fun parts of it because they know I'll take care of the play-by-play. -play. I mean, you got to give the score. On every in volleyball, every time in baseball, every third pitch. I mean, I, I'll I'll cross town and be in my car twenty minutes, and I won't get the score of the game. Mm -hmm. So I have to look at a red light on my phone. What the heck is the score? I mean, you've got to have the basics down. And I think also with hockey and and football and and volleyball, you got to be geographically faithful. So you got to say, you know, set right, set left. You just got to make it clear so you can picture it because I'm, we're not we're not on 
uh, TV and then the volleyball is very technical. You got to make it clear what team has the ball. I mean, unless it's ground ball to Jeter, I don't know what's happening. If you say ground ball to Jefferson, I mean, where, where, I, I got nothing. Okay. Ground ball, left side, third baseman, Jefferson backhands it, plants his right foot, fires across the infield. It's going to be close. Say, you know, now I, I saw the whole dog on thing with maybe a little bit of drama, but you know, I'm listening to a game with amateur athletes, Smith grabs the rebound, outlet to Joan. I mean, who's got the ball? Got no right. What's going on? So, you know, you got to have the, the technical stuff down. You got to make it easy so your, your fans can figure out what exactly, they can picture what's actually happened. Well, it's got to be 10 times harder than volleyball than baseball because volleyball moves a lot faster than baseball. I mean, there's one play that happens in baseball in that moment. And within those same 15 seconds, the ball could have gone back and forth two or three times. So I think you probably undercredit that piece, but it's something that you do well. But I do think the reason why people resonate with you so much is what you said earlier. It's, I think it's the humor. I think it's your connection with the fans. I think it's this desire to connect in a way that, that is, at a deeper level than just the um, the score, and those are without that you fail the technical piece. So the humor okay. piece, people are now frustrated with because you didn't see what's going on. Um, has it been more challenging or less challenging or the same at times? I know you've had to go off site a lot of times, meaning you're not in you hadn't been in the stadium for or the Coliseum or uh, not the Coliseum. You know what I mean? Inside the stadium for a couple of years at times because of COVID. Easier, or harder, or the same to um, present what's happening uh, in the match. It's a little harder because sometimes you can't tell who that player is. You can't see the number. You can't like look over and uh, uh, and then just because you just have a single angle um, from the camera. But it's not that different. I mean, you miss the ambiance. You miss the crowd, the roar of the crowd. I mean, I, I did the recent regional finals in Austin, Texas, and the, the final four in Columbus, Ohio in person. And I've done the Devaney matches in person this year, the home a court for Nebraska. And yet you, you get the, the noise just gets you caught up in it. I mean, in Texas, it was as loud a gym as I'd ever been in. Well, that definitely affects the broadcast. So yeah, the actual ambiance is helpful, but it's pretty close. And I'm actually very gratified that most fans say they can't tell the difference and they have no idea that I'm not there. The other thing you, you suggested a moment ago, Larry, I should have mentioned is that is in volleyball, you have to edit. You have to prioritize. You cannot describe every touch. In baseball, you typically don't have that problem unless you get a bang, bang play. So you got to practice those bang, bang plays. That means roll up your windshield, roll up your uh, your windows when you're driving around. Okay, here comes like, you know, uh, of a, a line drive in the alley, picked up by the right fielder, fires to the relay man. Here it comes. We got a close play at the plate. You got to practice that because you only get what? Three, four close plays, bang, bang plays in baseball, a game. And guess what they're going to play on the highlights? The bang, bang play. So you want to have those down. Okay, so so what, what role does somebody like Lauren Cook or Lauren Cook oh. West play as a color person to you? What is she, what has she added to oh. the broadcast for you? So much. She is so fun to work with. Uh, she's so candid. I think that's one reason people like our broadcasts. I've got a color commentator and who just uh, is very honest and maybe sometimes a little bit harsh in their minds. And then with her dad, who's the head coach, when she interviews him, everyone hangs on that because they know that's going to be uh, highly honest. And sometimes I have to step in and say, look, we don't want any family friction here if we can avoid it. <laughs> so, you know, but it is kind of enjoyable. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that rarely occurs. But she gets right to it and speaks <clears throat> truth. And people like that. I mean, you know, there's a reason we call it coach speak. And there's a reason, you know, very few press conferences are televised live. You know, it's, it's sanitized. We, we like reality. And, and uh, I think that's one thing that young people, especially my mom always said, you can't fool kids, you can't fool dogs. Uh, they crave authenticity. When you start talking about yourself in an honest way about relation, I remember to this day, a junior year in high school English teacher who talked about a relationship he had with a woman who cared more about him than apparently he reciprocated and how that sounded flattering, but it was very uncomfortable and difficult for both of them. I mean, to this day, and that was like a life lesson. The whole conversation might've lasted 90 seconds. For that moment, we got a glimpse into authenticity and real feelings, and especially young people crave that. And, you know, 
one, you know, we are marvelous in the Midwest. I, I now have lived in the Midwest almost 30 years and a big chunk of my childhood. We are marvelously charitable. We reach out and help each other in times of need. Couldn't find better and better neighbors. Or, but sometimes we accept the sanitized version of the conversation and we take things personally. Remember, I lived half of my childhood in Boston. Trust me, it's not sanitized there. I mean, I remember when I landed at Logan Airport and I realized, oh my goodness, the Ted Williams tunnel had just been built and I didn't know how to drive anymore. I mean, the whole thing was the, 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 big, the big dig was over. I didn't know what to do. The doggone uh, toll taker back then, it wasn't automated, is give me the business. He's like, how clueless are you? You just gotta go straight or what have you been, where have you been? I'm like, Gee, what? but it wasn't personal. It was so fun and we miss out. Like sometimes I wanna make comments about people in the Midwest, you gotta be careful. You gotta say, hey, you're awesome. It's the sweater I wanna talk about. You're fabulous. It's the sweater. Can we talk about your sweater? Anyway, I think if we would be a little more vulnerable and accept commentary um, a little more, I think we'd be quicker to getting to the truth about things. Anyway, be authentic. People will react much better than you can imagine. Yeah, you gave that last piece of the secret sauce, I think, about why people love you and Lauren, you, you separately, her separately, you together, authenticity. And people are very good at detecting that around here, maybe in most places, but certainly around here. So I've got a question for you that I think you've already answered, but I've got to answer it directly from the hills of Wyoming. Coach John Cook wanted to ask you this. After all these years of broadcasting, what is your why behind why you've stuck with it all these years as a broadcaster for Husker Volleyball? What's your why for doing this? You're saying why I can never get a promotion. Um, it's not the most lucrative. It's not the most prestigious job in my profession of sports casting, but I can't imagine one more enjoyable. I mean, Coach Cook and his predecessor, Terry Pettit, have created a, a, a culture which has welcomed me in and made me feel a part of it all rather than necessary extra baggage. Uh, I've called games for minor league baseball teams and, and other teams. And especially today, I, I think often there's a big arm's length distance between the people who are doing and then the people who get to describe. And I've never felt that gap with Nebraska volleyball. And so it's just true fun. I mean, it's just a wonderful escape from the other challenges of life. And I just get to call a game. I get to call a game and associate with a winner. How fun is that? Winning is pretty fun. Um, and uh, so it's multifaceted. It's not that simple. And I get a box seat into the greatest show on Terraflex and a window into a culture where everybody is all in. When I need to be re-energized, I enter Nebraska volleyball's ecosystem and get to call a match fun for its own sake, but then meet with the coach before the game, after the game, see the assistant coaches, talk to Kelly, talk to Tyler, talk to Jalen. And I'm re-energized because I'm around people who are highly skilled and highly committed to what they do. And that reminds me, oh yeah, this is it. I got to make sure I do that, not just when I'm here, but when I'm in the rest of my life. Yeah. So is that, you've mentioned the, the phrase secret sauce a few times, figure, trying to figure out your secret sauce. Given your, your unique seat, as you pointed out, you had more colorful words than me typically, but your seat at the table is unique right? Not just calling the games, but the behind the scenes stuff, some of the travel, like doing the interviews before and after, and that time period we cross paths with a lot of coaches and others. Like, what is the secret sauce to Nebraska volleyball? Is it simply that they have this culture of being all in at all levels, or is it, or is there more to it? Well, that's a byproduct. Uh, it's clearly stated goals. Uh, you don't even sit down as the volunteer secretary unless you're going to be all in and um, buy into these goals because you're a, you're a contributing factor to them. So in every interaction, you've got everyone's A game. So the goals are clear. Why those goals exist are self-evident. It's about championships. Um, 
and then uh, you've got uh, people who um, who don't just talk the talk. A lot, of, a lot of people make a lot of money making a bunch of speeches. All right, these people they're doing it, and they're uh, they're walking the walk, and uh, that's infectious. So I can't imagine putting on the jersey for Nebraska volleyball and being half-hearted or being distracted. So it doesn't, that culture doesn't happen overnight, uh, but Terry Pettit, purposeful, earnest, committed, caring. John Cook, purposeful, earnest, committed, caring. It's like when I start to teach, and I don't mean to compare myself with those two, those, those are legends, but when I teach, I always say, look, you're gonna get my A game. That's all I'm asking for in return. And there's just kind of a pause and people are like, Okay, I'll give this guy a chance. And that's implicit uh, in that culture. And then when I watch them with the pregame, it's so simple. I mean, it's such a complicated sport. Trust me, I don't fully understand what's going on. I got a, after 28 years of doing it, I've got a pretty good idea. But I mean, it's again, it's as a voyeur, it's as somebody who has been able to eavesdrop and observe, not actually do. Well, boy, it's like, okay. Kayla, you've got to take away the cross body. You know, Nicklin, you got to be sure. It's just, you know, very simple what they're supposed to do in a very complicated environment. And so clearly stated goals, commitment, expertise, a lot of joy, and then um, everything simplified. So uh, they, they've got it and they've never had it more so in, from my observations than, than right now, ever since 2015. Yeah. So what's cool, right, for both Pettit and Cook, you mentioned three or four words that have nothing to do with technical skills again. Uh, they are great at teaching the technical skills, right? There's no argument there. Mm -hmm. But the separators are those other things you talked about, being purposeful and being earnest. And, and the, the last thing you just mentioned just now, because I also had a seat at the table, not yeah. as much now, obviously, but a, a lot through 2015 and then even more beyond that, more with coach and some of the athletes and their assistant coaches. But I had a seat at the table too. You mentioned the word joy. And so I'm curious as we, as we kind of wrap this up, what have you observed in coach Cook? When I talk about evolution, I write about him in my book called the power of evolution. What have you observed that has registered this outcome to you where you just said they've never been more um, in this position to be successful than they ever have, like you said, since 15. What has Coach Cook done better that has nothing to do with the X's and the O's? What have you observed through your seat that um, is a factor in why Nebraska volleyball has never been in a better place? Who in their mid-50s reinvents himself? John Cook did that. I mean, he could have rested on his laurels driven off into the sunset with lots of conference championships and lots of wins and second round appearances and maybe a sweet 16 here or there, but he's, that wasn't, he had plenty of on the record book success, but he felt he had underachieved for a while and he had had a health scare. And I remember taking a jog with him. We used to jog when we were on the road trips, things have changed, unfortunately, but uh, we used to go on long jogs. And, and I remember at Texas A&M, he was, he was down. I hadn't heard him so down. And uh, he didn't say anything. It was implied like he was, he was searching. Like, how much longer do I really want to do this? It was a, it was a tough time. And to, to, to remember that moment, here we are 10 years later. And he's so happy. And from my vantage point, and has had so much even more greater success. And it was his willingness to just re-examine everything and reinvent at age, age 55. And you know this, you're instrumental to all of it, Larry, and I need to read your book. Um, but you know, bringing on sport psychologists for the team, a strength coach to travel with the team, always reading. He's oh, all the all the great ones read. You, you, they they take they set aside time and read, and he always does. He always has new ideas. He's always asking people ideas. He always asking me. I mean, he's never taken a single one of my ideas. I tried to get him to red shirt. Anyway, let's not get into it. But anyway, he hasn't to his wishes. To own credit, he has never <laughs> taken any of my ideas, but he considers them over and over. He makes me think he might. And, and for everyone to believe that they are valued. Um, wow. It's, uh, 
It's it's something. So I mean, a, a small example of that is you know, the fact that he no longer stands during during matches. He sits. That's just symbolic. We all can see and understand. That's a small pebble in a huge mountain of change that he has undergone since his mid fifties. He was thirty five. He was fifty five and had incredible job security. And he said, "No, I want to get better." And that's that's his 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 genius. And um, also being vulnerable, he's admitted he wishes he had you know coached the two thousand and seven team differently, for example, and and other things. Uh, again, that vulnerability uh, is probably somewhat new, uh, you know, for him in his you know sixty five year life. Uh, it's not four years old, but it's maybe not more than twelve years old. You know, it's only been maybe the last fifteen percent of his twenty percent of his life. So. Uh, that's, that's wonderful to see. And uh, all of his awards for that, you know, and his relationships and everything else is just, is great to see because one thing it does tick me off, Larry, is when people who don't work for it get it. But when people who work for it get it, oh, the world is just. Yeah, there's nothing better, right? And yeah. more importantly, I think we went from, and this is a great lesson for any coach at any level of um, is that we can go from a burnout situation to a joy situation. Mm-hmm. Um, if we learn to love, build relationships, be vulnerable. And without that, you can still be successful. Uh, there's a cost to being great. And we've seen that with John and Urban Meyer and lots of coaches, 90% wins, two national titles in his first eight years. And John was in trouble, right? He's written about it. I've written about it. It's not it's nothing, there's no shame in it. It's just a fact, which is, but can you imagine if his career just from a selfish standpoint had ended in 2009 because he had lost the joy and was burned out from his sport and he was sick from it. Right. And yet now look at how he's impacted lives, not just from winning, winning takes care of itself. I mean, did he win it all this year? No, but did he impact people's lives this year? Fans, Oh. athletes support staff the world husker nation yes um and then there's been years where he finished in the similar situation in a national title game and his team fell tremendously short and there was burnout and there wasn't joy and so it's not always about how far we go although there's usually some pairing to that um it's the it's the journey and the mm-hmm. journey has changed for him the journey what's cool is is you haven't said it you've said it a little bit the journey's changed for you um, and you're along the way here, what has your why in life, from what I hear a big part is, uh, and it, it, what stood out to me in this whole conversation is to make sure the people that I care about the most in this world know that I care about them. And I spend a lot more of my energy doing that every day. And that's what I've heard from you. All the rest, right, is gravy, right? I mean, but if you didn't have this one piece and you got to someone said you're the greatest volleyball announcer of all time there's never been a better test prep person than you of all time but you get to the end of your life or any part during the journey and you don't have the people in your life know that you care about them and you haven't worked very hard at that boy there's a lot of regret I think along the way and near the end and so you're learning that right now you're still in that growth process but what what I hear is there's a lot of parallels between what you do and what John Cook does in terms of your growth paths and you're 10 years behind him in age, but you're growing and learning like he is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that gives you the best chance at 65, whatever you're doing in this world, to be healthy and successful the way you've defined it uh, in your friends and others. Um, and that's a pretty cool place to be. So that's, for me, that's exactly why I wanted to speak with you today. I didn't know where it was going to go or how it was going to go. I just had this sense when I was thinking of out of the box people who's going to give the high performers of this world that listen to this some insight into your world and to other people's world about what makes it a successful life. And you've done that today for me. So I couldn't be more thankful for that. Is there anything else, John, that, that you haven't had a chance to share today that you want to make sure you shared that I didn't ask or you didn't say? Uh. I was very judgmental uh, growing up and I still have standards and I'm not, I don't apologize for them, but I'm much more understanding. I know a a young woman um, 
who's a high performer and she's suddenly for the first time in her life dealing with some anxiety. And I would have been like, oh, come on. Like, let's, like, let's play, let's play. And uh, I think sometimes we're guilty of excessive compassion. Uh, it's, a, it's a fine line, but uh, you know, we all have talents. And, and if, we, if we look at people and we say, oh, he's a bad kid or, oh, uh, it's, it's not salvageable. I mean, you know, it, it, instead it's like, you talked about earlier, an attitude for gratitude helps ourselves and attitude of gratitude towards others helps us with those relationships and continuing to connect and, and, um, and, and finding wonderfully surprising results. Uh, so I, I, I wish I could go back to my 18 year old self and say, would you just be a little more considerate and accepting of yourself primarily and, and imperfections, but others uh, as well. Because I, I was a jerk uh, towards a lot of people when I was younger, and I think I'm a jerk now, but to fewer people. How about that? How about that for improvement? I love that, right? I always say one of the biggest challenges of humans and leaders is to find that balance between love and accountability. Like you said, not excessive compassion to where you only love to this point that you don't hold somebody accountable to a standard, mm -hmm. but that we're not just accountable all the time and don't show that other piece. And so, again, that's evolution, right? That's evolving. Um, so to wrap this up then, right, one of the reasons why I think people find you so appealing on the air is that you have statements you say, you have phrases you say that are I don't know, that are really important to people, right? Sometimes they're funny ones. Sometimes they're really, really simple ones, right? And I've always, I haven't joked about this, but I've said it for a number of years when I used to drive home, especially when I worked with the Huskers and I would listen to the, the post game, you know, on the way. And I'd say to my kids or my wife in the car, here it's going to come, here it's going to come. Is he going to say it? And you have a great phrase that you say to wrap up your podcast. Not the very last thing you say, but you say about, right, my job. Fill, fill, fill in my audience about what you say that I love so much. All right, well, I, you say your thank yous at the end. And so I say, you know, for my broadcast partner, Lauren Cook West for the head coach, John Cook for our producers extraordinaire, Andrew and uh, Mike and, and the others, many thanks. They're the Beethovens at the Steinway. They're handling the dials tonight. My name's John Baylor. My role tonight was to describe what I saw. Mission accomplished. I'll yeah. talk to you Tuesday night for the coaches show and Friday night, bring on Penn State at another jam-packed Devaney Center. Until then, good night, Nebraska. Yeah, and that last piece, right? I love the mission accomplished piece, right? But the Husker Nation loves, right? That last thing you say to them because they're either in Lincoln they might be in the military around the world. They may have moved to a town where nobody appreciates Husker volleyball. And here's John Baylor saying, good night, Nebraska, right? And I think there's real power in that, more than maybe you realize. But I think that's what I hear from people, which is it brings some semblance of normalcy to their lives. Mm. They can count on the same thing being said every day by John Baylor as he wraps up his pod, uh, his, his, his broadcast wow. and then all the other things along the way. So uh, thank you for doing this today. And um, sure. you exceeded my expectations. And for the, for the people that listen, I know they're going to learn a lot from you about what it takes to evolve in this world and what it takes to uh, be successful in this world, whatever you do. Well, Larry, it's an honor to be here and for you to have asked me and I really enjoy this conversation and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. All right.